How's it going? Hey. <laughs> so um, I think while we're letting people stream in, I'll just g give a couple announcements and um, uh, just fill you in on just some activities that's been revolving around the Drupal working group here at, uh, at ESIP. So my name is Adam Shepard. I am the co-chair of the Drupal working group here with uh, David Bassendine from Blue Dot Lab. Uh, we've been co-chairing for, I think, the past three years now. Um, and so for today's presentation, uh, we are just super excited to have New Civic here to present on one of their products called Decan. Um, but before we get to that and before I introduce Andrew and Sid, um, I just wanted to highlight a couple things. So for today's session, we every Drupal session, we have a Google Docs uh, for notes, for shared notes, and that link is right up at the top. Um, and we'll paste it into the um, GoToMeeting chat there so our remote participants can jump in there. The slides link is there as well. And uh, you can get in touch with our group in a number of ways. Obviously, come and approach me or shoot me or David an email. Uh, but we're on drupal.groups.org, Twitter, YouTube, Slack, Google+. We're just, yeah, we're uh, everywhere, I guess. Um, so just a little bit about our group. We have monthly telecons online uh, on the fourth Wednesday of every month on uh, GoToMeeting. Um, so you can always check us out there. Typically, it's just a, a round table of, of folks that are working on Drupal and what sort of projects and problems we're, we're facing. Um, and then sometimes we'll have guest speakers. So you can look to the monthly, or the, excuse me, the Monday updates from ESIP on our current activities there and who might be speaking. Um, join us on Slack for on the off Wednesdays. So we have like a sort of office hours where we all code and work on problems. Uh, so there's some really cool activity going on there um, just around Drupal and science and, and some of the issues that are going on uh, with graphics and visualization, data, and, and all sorts of cool things. So some of the projects that we've been working on the past year um, have been citations and DOIs in Drupal. That's been a really cool project. Um, and another project that's in beta right now, and uh, we've got one deployment out, is a, a Data One member node that's implementing the Tier One API. So that's really cool that we've been able to, to roll that out under this project. Um, okay, I talked about Andrew and Decan. I will introduce them in a second. I, so I want to highlight a couple of the things that our Drupal group here at ESIP. Uh, does and and one of the coolest opportunities that we have are to uh, send two people from the ESIP community out to DrupalCon each year, which is such a cool, such a cool experience. Um, so we have two opportunities at twenty one hundred bucks of reimbursement to send your web people or yourself, but uh, don't be selfish. Tell your web people about this opportunity and and have them sign up. And you can find out more information at that bit.ly link, which just redirects to the uh, ESIP wiki. Uh, and then we also have this yearly $300 of support to attend local Drupal camps uh, in your area. And so we've got five opportunities each year. So uh, you can find out more. I don't know what just happened. That was funky. What did I do? Am I... OK, there we go. See, it's like I, I work with computers, right? Um, OK. So those are our opportunities. If you want to know more, you can always hit me up anytime. Uh, come grab me, and I can give you more information there or, or hit these links. Um, and there is, let me just head back to the front slide. OK, um, I'm supposed to remind everyone to do this I'm here check-in thing. Um, I, I feel terrible because I haven't done it all week, and I'm standing up here like telling people to check in. So I feel bad. I, I haven't, I'm not practicing what I preach here. but. I guess I'm obligated to tell you that. Um, okay, so without further ado, I don't want to waste time here. Uh, we are super fortunate to have Andrew Hoppin and Sid Burgess here from New Civic slash Gov Delivery. Uh, Andrew is the co-founder and president of, of New Civic. Uh, he's been working in Drupal since beyond, before 2005, right? <laughs> uh, so Andrew was the, the keynote at 2010's DrupalCon in San Francisco. Uh, and he serves on a board for a number of uh, initiatives so around open government and uh, open data. And so uh, without further ado, I'll ask Andrew to come up and present. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, really good to be here. I 
do need my coffee this morning, so that's going to be there. Is this yours? Do you want your oh, yes, yeah. thank you. Appreciate it. Um, it's a super great pleasure of mine to be here. Um, I love Drupal. Um, needless to say, I have been working on it since I think it actually, I hit, I hit a day in 2004, coming out of the 2004 presidential campaign. So it goes way back to when DrupalCon was basically 20 people and uh, the founder of the project, Dries Buitart, in a bar. Um, that was DrupalCon circa circa 2005. Um, on top of that, I'm a planetary scientist by training, so even though I don't haven't done that in a long time, and um, uh, y'all are inevitably way, way ahead of me in that realm, um, you know, doing science with Drupal is, is near and dear to my heart for that reason. Um, so I'm really honored to be here. Um, what I thought I'd do today is um, just quickly, I'd love to go around the room if you don't mind and just get a sense of who's here and what you'd like to get out of this session because there are a lot of things that we could talk about. Um, and I want to make sure that it's, it's uh, valuable to, to you, first and foremost. Um, my colleague Sid and I here, just to introduce him briefly, um, work every day trying to help governments open up their data. And we do it primarily using a technology that we've uh, developed as a company uh, called DCAN. It's, uh, we'll get way into the weeds on this, but it's a Drupal-based open data platform. Um, and uh, Sid is, uh, I think, uh, far beyond I, the person who's got the real hands-on, on-the-ground experience using that technology to actually make a difference in people's lives. Um, and that's, that's really where the rubber meets the road for us is not about technology, not about Drupal, but about making a difference in the, in the world. So Sid will, Sid will get into the, sort of the, art, the art of that at the end um, after I cover more of, of the, uh, the specifics of the technology and, and how it fits in the Drupal universe. Um, but just quickly, um, that's enough about me. If you don't mind, I'd love to just go around really quickly and just say who you are, um, what organization you're from, and uh, whether uh, if there's something specific you'd like to get out of this session today, um, and, like, and uh, that would be really helpful. Including like I, you know, I've been doing Drupal since 2005, or I just heard about Drupal and I thought it was interesting. Um, that'll help me calibrate a little bit, you know, what level I, I talk at today. So if you don't mind, please. So my name is Adila. Uh, I'm from Rice State University in Ohio. Okay. Uh, I'm not a developer, but uh, I would say I, I'm an on ontology engineer. Okay. So we'll be very interested in Drupal because we want to be a rather important uh, platform for publishing link open data on, okay. on the web. Okay. So awesome. Um, sorry if I'm messing with your room logistics here. No, not at all. This is totally cool. Uh, my name is Adam Shepard. I've I work at a Wood Solution Graphic Institution for a data facility funded out of NSF. Uh, I've been working for them since 2012. Um, that's when I started Drupal. So uh, I'm basically a back end developer um, and love the platform. Awesome. Hi, uh, I'm Johanna. I'm a student fellow, so this is uh, new stuff to me. I mostly work on climate literacy stuff. So interested to learn. Hey, Wayne Burke with uh, NASA JPL, and um, yeah, know a fair amount about Drupal, and just kind of interested in how things have come along the last couple of years. Louis John McGibney, uh, engineer at JPL. I uh, know nothing about DCAN, so here to learn about today. Awesome, thanks. Roland Schweitzer, I'm a contractor at the Pacific Marine Environmental Lab. I write uh, mostly server-side Java and user interfaces using the Google Web Toolkit don't know anything about Drupal. I'm Bruce Karen. I'm uh, here with ESIP. I'm the community architect. Uh, uh, but in my other life, I started using Drupal, Drupal 4. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Might want to look at the security on that. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Kat Tipton. I'm with USGCRP. Uh, I'm a software developer, and I'm looking at different server backends to better display our provenance and metadata for climate. Hi, I'm Doug Phils. I work with Ocean Leadership. Um, I am involved with uh, NSF-funded data projects around uh, scientific ocean drilling. And I don't use Drupal, but I'm intrigued and interested in how Drupal talks to other tools uh, for the exchange of information. I'm uh, Chris McDermott. I am a contractor with NOAA. I work on the NOAA data catalog. I'm interested in learning the advantages Drupal gives you over uh, uh, CCAN. 
Uh, Michael Weingren, I'm with the U.S. IUS, uh, Integrated Ocean Observing Systems Office of NOAA. Uh, we publish an open data catalog based on CCAN, and I don't know anything about DCAN, but just looking to compare the two. Hi, <clears throat> I'm James Gallagher, and I'm clearing my throat. I'm the interim president of OpenDAP. And I'm in, and we use Drupal for a lot of things. Um, I'm interested in integrating Drupal with data servers, and uh, particularly the cataloging aspect of that integration. Great. Peter Fox, RPI. Uh, what can we say? Um, so we've uh, we have a Frankenstein version of. Drupal, which was semantically enabled back in 2008. And we've done integration of uh, Drupal, Vivo, CCAN, and the ha global handle uh, system um, in production for four or five years now. Um, and uh, DCAN sort of sounds a little also Frankenstein-ish, so I'm looking forward to hearing what that actually really is. Uh, ben Wheeler, USGS. I'm one of the data.gov points of contact for USGS. So I work with CCAN a lot. We have a lot of internal Drupal projects a lot. So I'm kind of curious what the connections are, what the benefits is. Some folks have said over here about how DCAN uh, builds upon um, uh, base CCAN and those kinds of things. Great. Chuck Mertens from UNAFCO. I don't know either can and just keeping an eye on Drupal stuff. I'm Jenny Fox. I'm with uh, the NOAA's Earth Systems Research Lab. And we have some Drupal stuff, but nothing in production yet. So I was just checking this out. Hi there. I'm Eugene Berger with uh, Pacific Marine Environmental Lab. Uh, we have a Drupal uh, instance there that serves all our public facing web pages, everything except the data pages. Okay. So this is something we have not done because of a complexity, integrated data pages uh, or, or data serving pages into uh, Drupal. So this is of particular interest to okay. us. Hey, Dave Blodgett. I'm with the US Geological Survey Water Mission Area. Um, somewhat similar, we've got, we've recently kind of had our enterprise switch over to Drupal for web content. Um, and I'm curious what's going on with this, although I'm not in that sphere of influence, so this is just a curiosity. Uh, my name is Jim Duncan. I'm with the University of Vermont and have no knowledge of Drupal, but a passing familiarity with CCAN, so I'm interested to learn more. Hi, I'm Steve Young, retired from EPA and with a small company called Innovate. I've been uh, kind of vaguely aware of Drupal for a few years now, so I'm trying to play catch up a little bit. And I, I was in the um, open data, data.gov game back when I was at EPA. So I'm very familiar with kind of that general open data policy thought process. Cool. Great. Well, that is super helpful for me. Thank you. Um, and uh, let's see, just ground rules for this. Um, Sid, please jump in anytime because um, Sid often has smarter things to say than I do about important things. Um, but likewise, you all, please jump in and ask any questions. Um, if you bear with me, what I think I'll do is I'll give a little bit of background on how DCAN came to be. Um, as well as what it is. And then we'll go into some actual just live examples to help you get a sense of actually what it's doing in the world today. Um, and then uh, time permitting, which I think there probably will be, um, I'll ask Sid to come up and um, walk you through sort of how we see organizations really succeeding with it in terms of actually making sure they create outcomes in the world that matter. Um, I will say we're a little bit uh, opinionated and I guess focused as a team on um, on people and engaging people, um, DCAN, as with CCAN and any other open data platform, worth its salt, spends a lot of time uh, managing data on the back end and doing sort of the, the art and the standards of that. Um, I'd say one area, uh, which we'll get into more where DCAN is a bit distinct, is that it's really about uh, bringing data together with other kinds of contents and also with human beings. And we're really focused on that as a use case. Um, and that's, um, really part of uh, why we use Drupal, because Drupal already does that sort of thing uh, for so many people in the world. So um, to help give some context on that, I'll just give a little bit of background on how DCAN came to be. Um, long story short, I left government in 2011 and came to work for, uh, started my own company, New Civic, and later sold it to a bigger company, GovDelivery, which works with most federal agencies and 
thousands of governments around the world. Um, what our uh, government delivery does basically is provides enterprise support around DCAN, um, including a, a hosted software as a service. Um, but I got into open data and op doing open data with Drupal actually back in 2009 when data.gov was, was getting going in the US and data.gov.uk um, in the United Kingdom. And um, those platforms launched relatively contemporaneously. I um, believe the original data.gov in the US um, actually uh, had some Drupal components to it. Maybe uh, people can correct me on that. Um, but this is, you know, very early days of the Obama administration um, when he issued the Open Government Directive uh, in his first month in office. In the UK, uh, Drupal was involved. It was a Drupal uh, essentially for, uh, for content pages and CCAN for um, data sets and data resources. And so a bit of a Frankenstein there. And I believe that still is the architecture, data.gov. UK. So Drupal has been in the mix um, from very early on. Um, what I was doing at that time was I was working in the last place anybody ever thought that there'd be open data, which is the New York State Senate. Um, I was uh, the first and, and to this day only CIO in the New York State Senate. Um, and literally, I think we've now have a run of about five uh, majority leaders in that institution who have been indicted on corruption charges. Um, so uh, needless to say, it was a bit ironic that what we did that was really successful there was open data. Um, this is our CRM system at the time, basically a green screen. Uh, this is our website at the time, you know, basically hand coded HTML to people in the whole institution could, could do anything with it. Um, and, you know, having worked with Drupal since um, 2004, 2005, the first thing that we went in there and did is we said, well, we can at least make it a lot easier to get information out to uh, the public. Um, and to empower more than just two human beings to do so if we use Drupal. So uh, we set about um, launching a, relaunching the public website with Drupal. And uh, it was went well, three-month build process, basically. Um, and uh, suddenly we transformed this you know, very opaque institution, um, somewhat ironically, into, at the time, the most transparent in terms of access to information of any uh, local government legislature, um, we think in the in the country, because um, we did uh, basically took everything we could get our hands on that was digital, and we made sure that it was accessible and also managed in a in a content management system. Um, and then we had trained about 800 staff to actually be hands on directly in terms of managing that information. Um, and a lot of that information turned out to be data. Um, and we came to think of it over time as open data. Um, in part because of the example and therefore the sort of the, the cultural meme that was starting in our community around government open data, thanks to uh, the Obama administration's work at the time at data.gov. But we started out just thinking of it as content, and that's you know why we did it with Drupal. Um, but pretty quickly, it became clear that the stuff that the public was interested in New York State with the very, you know, uh, deservedly uh, reputed for corruption uh, part of the legislature was actually the data. Um, so how much money I got paid, for example, payroll reports with my name and title and salary and how often I was supposed to show up at work. We put that online. We rolled our own essentially very simple rudimentary open data catalog using Drupal. Um, and so you could go get the, get the rows and the columns and the actual numbers. Um, we also, though, thought of things that um, the institution at all thought of just as content as data, and we treated it like that and organized it like that within Drupal. Um, and that turned out to be quite important in terms of what we could then do with it. So, um, you know, there are legislative committees that make laws in a legislature, obviously. And we treated the, you know, the uh, name of that committee and the subject areas that they work on as structured data. Um, the locations of their meetings as structured data, the list of bills that they would be uh, talking about in a committee meeting as structured data, the live stream uh, video feed of that meeting, all that as data. Um, and that allowed us to have data assets that the institution had never had before treated as data um, that we could then do use to create other experiences and um, initiatives with. And the reason this was easy was really because we used Drupal. Um, we had the insight that any content we put into Drupal was actually already def you know, inherently data. Um, there's taxonomies associated with content in Drupal. Um, everything is structured, everything, you know, you know, when something was published, you know, who published it, you know, what permissions are associated with editing it, that sort of thing. So, um, Drupal turned out to be, and we had no prescience about this. It just, we, we were lucky, I think turned out to be a fantastic way to manage the kind of data that we, 
uh, were charged with opening up um, in the New York State Senate. Uh, events were even data. Events were a big deal um, in terms of uh, how laws got made and how politics was done in New York State. So actually knowing what was happening when and where and how to, how you, whether you could get in to go be there, um, and also whether you could watch a live stream of it if you couldn't go be there. Um, that turned out to be a really important thing. Um, and a data feed, essentially, that people appreciated. Um, video, just, you know, they're never, you had to li literally go to Albany three hours away from New York City prior to uh, the launch of the site in order to find out what was happening in terms of the laws that were being made in New York State, um, but just by live streaming everything, we made it so that you could really follow it from anywhere. That became a big deal when New York State uh, Senate was one of the first institutions in the country after Massachusetts to really seriously debate marriage equality. Um, and so suddenly these people that had never been seen by anybody who didn't show up in Albany um, were literally all over the world and be, you know, having their own, uh, you know, for, for good or for ill, um, suddenly, you know, uh, starlet reputations uh, forged in so doing. Um, then from a data perspective, probably the most important thing we came to find was uh, discoverability. So just the ability to go to a, sort of a, a Google-like search interface, type in a word like Mary, and get an auto-suggest back of the bills, the data that pertained, um, was a real game changer in terms of opening up um, this very opaque and sometimes corrupt process in New York State to average New Yorkers um, to be able to actually weigh in on things that they cared about. Um, so that the ability to treat bills as data was was fundamental to that. Um, that also meant that we could then augment that data with people's input on it. So we opened up all bills to public comment before they're voted on, the first legislature and local level to do that in the country. Um, again, Drupal just made that easy because Drupal commenting on uh, on content is uh, sort of a given. Um, we also that also made it easy to share it where people were going to find it. Most people don't wake up in the morning going to nysenate.gov. Instead, they go to their uh, social media community if they're in fact online at all. And turned out that people would actually put that content into the community conversations that they cared about around issues that they cared about, and that gave a lot bigger exposure to our data um, than it otherwise would have would have had. Um, similarly, just going to Google and typing in the same kind of keyword search, not at nysenate.gov, but because Drupal has good search engine optimization as a content management system, by getting our data into Drupal, de facto, we made it really easy for search engines to find it and understand it, and therefore for a lot of people to find it and actually make use of it. Um, so sometimes I can talk for hours about that, but just you know, fairly uh, long story short, uh, this is a big deal in New York State and really transformative because we think it collapsed geography. It meant that the half of the population, 10 million plus that live in New York City, no longer had to travel three hours to Albany to find out what was going on, and, and be, let alone being able to weigh in on the laws that were being made that we live under in New York State. Um, and so that was a really inspiring experience for our team uh, to see that you know a very relatively straightforward technology we've been working with for ages could actually have that effect if applied um, uh, in an in a innovative way in an institution like that. Um, so on the backs of that and you know a bunch of you know sort of ways of, of measuring that success, um, we uh, when the control of the institution flipped over to the other political party in 2011, um, we uh, left the institution and decided to create a, a company to help other governments do the same thing. Um, and we decided to do that with Drupal. Um, at that, uh, fast forward to today, obviously open data is a, a, a ubiquitous thing. Pretty much everybody in this room is doing something with it, it sounds like. Um, so that kind of work is no longer at all innovative, um, in my view. Um, but it, it, it felt like it at the time, circa 2009. Um, and this is a wonderful new day, the, the sense that open data is just a given, that it's, it's de rigueur for any government, um, I think is a, is a wonderful uh, place to be in. Um, but there's still a lot of questions about how to do it right. Um, you know, it's a fast moving, ever evolving thing. Um, and we're a bit opinionated that using a content management system, in our case Drupal, is a great way to do it. Um, so I'll go into a little bit more into why. Um, so why is a content management system to manage data? Well, um, we've seen from even the very early days of data.gov.uk where CCAN and Drupal were used side by side and data.gov, which is WordPress and CCAN used side by side that um, you need to put data in the context of content really to make it useful. Um, and we certainly had that experience with nysenate.gov and the New York State Senate. 
um, if you need to do that, if you need to put data in the context of content to make it make sense and to make it easier to, for people to find it and do things with it, um, it begs the question in our view, why not just use a content management system to, to do it? Um, and that's really why we built DCAN. We started using uh, CCAN, which is a, a wonderful Python-based piece of op uh, open source software and Drupal to do these things the way that data.gov.uk was, was doing it for clients. Um, but we found that it was uh, relative to our expertise with Drupal, it was quite cumbersome for us to do that. Um, and so partly to solve our own problem that we wanted to help governments efficiently, um, we said, you know, we could do this all with Drupal. Um, we spoke with the CCAN folks and said, well, what if we create a, a parallel project called DCAN that uh, is inspired by CCAN, but, but is just Drupal? Um, and they said, fine, we'd, we'd, be, we'd be happy with you calling it DCAN and, and good luck, uh, basically. And so that's how DCAN came to be. Um, other reasons why, the reasons why we found that to be useful uh, from the very early days was that, you know, uh, any content management system written in PHP, WordPress and Drupal included um, is going to be really be a different software stack and therefore a different set of skills for developers to work on than a Python based piece of software, CCAN. Um, and so by doing everything with Drupal, managing content uh, traditionally thought of and data in a single um, PHP based piece of software meant that we could hire people with PHP skills who didn't also need Python skills in order to be able to, to work on the software. Similarly, uh, governments that were just downloading and using the software didn't need such a diverse skill set in order to be able to, to really work with it. So a single software stack uh, to maintain and, and this uh, single set of skills that are, that are needed for that. Um, also, of course, the user interface for people is uh, a big part of this, even if a lot of the point of an open data uh, program is to get your data, make your data discoverable to machines, um, you know, via APIs and what have you, the human user interface is really important. Um, content management systems tend to be really good at that. You know, they're easy to design, uh, apply design to, apply theming to without a lot of deep technical skill. And um, if you need to do that, doing that again with a single piece of software and a piece of software that already has a bunch of tooling built in for uh, site administrators to manage the look and the feel um, is a pretty big deal instead of having to do that in two different pieces of software that work in two different ways uh, in terms of their user interface design. Um, and then, you know, as our experience with NewYorkSenate.gov was a lot of people didn't come to our data site, if you will, to find the data about the New York State uh, Legislature. Instead, they found it on Facebook, they found it on Google. Um, and the simple things like the ability to ex uh, expose that data with social uh, features, um, plugins, search engine optimization, all those things, we get out of the box because of Drupal. Whereas with um, bespoke open data technologies built just for open data, those are often uh, built on later as an afterthought, if you will. Um, and um, there's nothing wrong with that. You can certainly do it competently, but you actually have to sort of proactively think about it and plan for it um, and then build it in as versus it just being de facto out of the box as it is with, with a typical content management system. Um, and then finally, you know, I spent a lot of time as a CIO uh, trying to choose technologies, um, not just on the basis of there being open source, which is fundamental to me in terms of being able to, you know, hold vendors to account and, and uh, not being locked in to any particular proprietary technology or, or company um, as a government, but also uh, looking at sustainability of those open source projects. And um, so the larger the project, the more healthy the economic ecosystem around that project, the more the larger the volume of contributors to that project, um, the less risk I perceived as a CIO in choosing an open source technology and making investments in it. And um, Drupal just rates, you know, in the top, very top tier of open source projects globally in terms of its scale. You know, it's got tens of thousands of contributing engineers. Um, it's been around as uh, my gray hair proves since before 2005. And, uh, you know, we have conferences of thousands of people and big convention centers. And there are, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars at least being transacted every year around Drupal as an economic ecosystem. Um, all that means is it's unlikely to my mind to go away in a couple of years. And I'm likely as a government technology user or investor uh, to be able to find people that are already familiar with it, either in my organization or people that I can hire as consultants or vendors or people that I may be able to recruit as civil servants. And that's actually a really big deal, um, especially if you're investing in uh, an open source uh, platform to be able to 
believe that it's a good investment for the long term in terms of sustainability. So those are all a bunch of reasons why to use the CMS and Drupal obviously is one of the top the top tier CMSs in the world. Um, and I already spoke about sort of why content needs to go, go along with data. Um, so just to get into the meat a little bit more, uh, DCAN is a Drupal based um, uh, CMS platform for open data. So instead of getting vanilla Drupal, when you spin up a DCAN site, um, which uh, uh, as is a, a constant knock against Drupal in the in the uh, in the world, a vanilla Drupal site out of the box doesn't look very good. Um, you actually have to do things to it to make it uh, to to make it look good and to actually uh, deliver any utility. Um, DCAN, as a what we call a distribution of Drupal or a pre-configured version of Drupal. Um, is an open data portal out of the box. So it works much like data.gov uh, when you download the code and you spin it up. Um, and more specifically, it includes uh, uh, all the uh, core Drupal functionality. So that managing user accounts and taxonomies and all these things that a content management system uh, inherently does. But we've also added uh, data management specific features, um, most notably a uh, data set content type and we'll get a little bit more into what that is later. Um, and also a data store. So you can actually uh, put files into a data store and end up with a SQL table and end up with an API endpoint on that, on that data. Um, and then a bunch of uh, data publishing workflow tools and a bunch of data visualization capabilities so that you can end up doing the sort of plurality of the things that most open data portals um, call for all within a single uh, piece of Drupal technology. Um, we endeavor to make it open standards compliant. So uh, there's an international standard called for uh, metadata, um, which is basically the, the way you describe what's in a set of uh, files um, compliant with uh, the W3C's DCAT standard, DCAT. Um, a permutation of that is US Project Open Data, um, which there's a ton of information online about uh, if you're not already familiar. Um, we make sure that DCAN is uh, standards compliant with both of those out of the box so that when you download it, you'll have uh, metadata already, uh, fields already described that will enable you to publish data sets that are compliant with, with those standards. And essentially that means your data catalogs are able to talk to one another. So um, when you uh, upload a data set into a DCAN site, um, uh, for example, say the US Health and Human Services, uh, healthdata.gov, um, because the data sets in there are US Project Open Data compliant, uh, it's really easy for data.gov to find and grab those data sets, um, and vice versa, if you wanted to set it up that way. Um, so the, the data should flow freely, whatever technology you're, you're using, the uh, metadata standards, and in the case of uh, US federal government, in particular US Project Open Data, are the key, the key to that, um, to be able to describe the data sets in a consistent way. Um, as I've already spoken about at length, you know, holistic information management, we think is where um, the future of open data really lies. It shouldn't just be a file and therefore you should sort it over there or a map and therefore you should sort it over there or a blog post and therefore you should store it over here. Ideally, you'd have one set of technologies that work really seamlessly together to be able to manage all that information even if it's not stored in the same literal data store, because certainly different kinds of data call for different kinds of data storage, um, but the ability to really at least treat the description of what that data is and where it is and who can do what with it, um, we think it's ideal to have that all be able to uh, be managed through a single technology for many governments. There are certainly valid use cases where that's not the ideal architecture, but for many that, um, we found that are not yet doing a great job with, with open data, um, that are really struggling to be able to just manage the, the process around it and the technologies around it, that this is a really streamlined way to get there to do open standards compliant, best practice consistent, uh, holistic information management to, to use a platform like DCAN that can manage it all. Um, <clears throat> And again, because it's Drupal, um, it's not really our project. It's really just a permutation of, of a open source technology, which is used and uh, contributed to by tens of thousands of people around the world. Um, so just to summarize, uh, native Drupal technology, right? So it's not CCAN. Um, it is inspired by CCAN, and it adheres to the same standards. And we, we try as best we can to mimic the same functionality as CCAN. Um, but really it is just Drupal. So if you're a Drupal developer, you'll be intimately familiar with everything that's there. 
um, when you download Decan and try to spin it up. There is no Python code in there. Um, there are some uh, shared JavaScript uh, libraries that are shared between CCAN and Decan that our team also contributes code to. Um, and JavaScript being cross-platform, cross obviously, that, that's a, a fairly straightforward thing to do. Um, but it is not a, a Frankenstein in the sense of Drupal here and CCAN there, and they're, they're kind of bolted together. Um, there have been a number of efforts to productize that over the time, uh, most notably the Open Government Platform, or OGPL, that the U.S. and the Indian government invested in together circa, I think, about 2010. Um, and that didn't really work, honestly. Um, it was too complicated and cumbersome to maintain that particular Frankenstein in a way that governments could just download it and spin it up and be successful with it. Um, so it really is just best practice Drupal engineering under the hood. Um, that, that's what DCAN is. Um, it's uh, what we think of as an agile open source project, meaning that we're, we have a team behind it that is iterating it all the time. Um, and it is released as a product. It has release versions. It has a GitHub repo where you can look at the development branch and you can look at the, the, um, the latest release branch and release notes and all the things you might uh, expect from a um, sort of well-managed open source project. Um, even out, way outside the Drupal community, you'll find with Decan. Um, so you don't have to go to drupal.org and uh, grab Decan core and then grab a bunch of contributed modules and then configure them. We basically do all that for you. And we do that as a, a package of code that you can grab directly on GitHub. Um, we also make it such that you can have a version of it that will spin up easily on Pantheon or on Acquia, um, two of the leading plat Drupal platform as a service uh, hosting companies in the world. So literally with uh, just a couple of clicks, you can have your own Decan instance on either of those two platforms. Um, straightforward as well, obviously, to put it on, on uh, AWS or anywhere else. Um, I already spoke at length about why we think holistic information cataloging is important. Worry about your content as well as your data. Um, I think it's material that Gov Deliveries uh, you know, got thousands of clients. D data is a very small part of what they do, but it's nice to have a large, um, relatively large mature enterprise behind a product. Um, even if it's open source and you never ever want to pay Gov Delivery or anyone else to help you with DCAN because you have the technical talent in-house, um, which we think is fantastic, by the way. Um, it's still good to know that there's a real significant entity with significant economy around an open source uh, product that's investing in it all the time. Um, and then, again, we'll get into this a little bit more uh, later, uh, particularly with, with Sid, but um, we think that the place where data really makes a difference is when people find it and understand it and do things with it. And so we're focused very much in terms of the roadmap for, for DCAN, um, and also in part because there's so much innovation around in the Drupal community around these things on data visualization, on storytelling, and on engagement of people. Um, that's where we really think the rubber the rubber meets the road of, of open data. Um, as a company, the way that the reason we do this as a company and the way, reason that the the uh, finance folks in the company allow us to do it is we we provide it as a software as a service to governments that want that. Um, and these are some of the governments that that work with Gov Delivery in that way. Um, it's really a global project at this point, so this is a little bit out of date list, but it's used in more in uh, 32 countries. I think we counted the other day, so um, it's really widespread. And let me just get out of here and just show you a couple examples. Um, this is healthdata.gov, um, and I think they just crossed the 3,000 data set threshold the other day, um, which is cool. Yeah, here's their blog post about reaching 3,000 data sets, and this is a very typical. Uh, open data portal use case um, and a typical out of the box DCAN use case. So, um, you know, you, t you typically have a, for a portal, um, a landing page. And in this case, they've chosen to organize their, their data um, into topics. And that's one way to drill in is, right? I want to find, you know, data that's related to Medicare. And essentially, that's just a, a search on data that's related to Medicare. I can, um, with uh, faceted search tools, drill in more deeply to that. So I could say, OK, I'm looking at all the, the data that's tagged with the topic Medicare. But let me uh, I just want to find ones that are uh, tagged with Medicare that are CSVs. OK, and I've just drilled in with a, with a second facet to find the uh, eight data sets that meet those criteria. Um, and then uh, once you've, I've maybe find the data that I'm looking for, um, which is also described, by the way, in other ways, like who the, who the owner is, like this one is the Office of Medicare Hearings and Appeals. Um, 
and I can drill in and see a lot more about a data set. Um, I can actually see the, the files that are associated with it, the actual CSVs, the rows and the columns. Um, I can see other topics that this data set um, is tagged with, and I can see important metadata like the license, like this is an Open Data Commons license. Um, I can also get a JSON version of it or an RDF version of it. I can share it easily in social media. Um, and I see the metadata, which um, is those two standards I mentioned, uh, DCAT, which is an international standard, which tells you important things like, you know, who, who's responsible for this and what geographic area it covers and who you might get in touch with about it if you're interested in more about it. Um, and then I also see uh, additional uh, metadata fields um, which often come from U.S. product open data requirements. So there are bureau codes that are specific to U.S. federal government, for example, that um, help federal agencies and software built in the federal government to find and manage data to understand what, what they're looking at. Um, so that's a very typical thing. One notable um, thing that healthdata.gov does is they've uh, chosen to use the groups functionality built into DCAN, which is essentially organic groups um, for, for people that know Drupal. Um, to manage the uh, publishing of data by having a number of uh, sub-agencies and also, in some cases, local governments be empowered to publish their data into healthdata.gov. Um, so here's data from the city of Chicago or data from the city of San Francisco. And so this makes it more of a rich one-stop shop for health-related data to be able to have all these sub-organizations or these peer organizations also sharing their data here. Um, that can happen in one of two ways. So because this is organic groups, we can actually um, you know, have people request group membership and actually be empowered as human beings with permission to publish data here if HHS chose to do it that way. But we also can set up automated data harvests so that um, if the city of San Francisco from its data portal, which I believe is using Socrata uh, software, which is a proprietary software as a service, um, if that exposes data.json, um, then the uh, healthdata.gov can be set up and we have tools to do this to automate the setup of harvesting that data from the city of San Francisco's portal and putting it into healthdata.gov and then having some review of whether they actually want that data to, to go live after they review it. So the ability to share data between catalogs is a big deal. All this data as well on healthdata.gov um, after data.gov team manages it here and gets now, I guess there are 31, 22 data sets um, it's actually required that that make its way into data.gov. And by exposing data.json, um, the uh, HHS uh, is able to ensure that so that um, the same data ends up and is searchable here in data.gov. Okay, so that's a, a key concept and one that we automate so that out of the box, you're able to do that in the best practice way. Um, and Similarly, CCAN makes that makes that easy, and um, really any open data portal worth its salt should should make it easy for that data to flow freely, both on the harvesting side, gathering data into your portal, and then also on the federation side, pushing that data out to other data portals, um, or at least allowing them to pull yours and discover it and pull that data into their portal if they wish. Um, just one other federal example. This is um, more science related, obviously. The U.S. Department of Agriculture uses DCAN, um, and they've taken, I think, a, a more sort of visually rich approach, which is cool. They have uh, um, really do try to put the, the data in the context for their uh, scientist community that will matter to that specific community. So they've done some things that are uh, not out of the box DCAN that are very specific to their needs, but because it's open source, because it's Drupal, it's straightforward to extend. Um, so they've added data dictionaries to their content. They've added um, things like uh, they've integrated a uh, ag science thesaurus, which is about 80,000 terms, I believe. Um, and that is an additional uh, way that they're able to describe the data in their catalog. Um, they also have added uh, citations. And these are, in some cases, functionality that uh, they hired us to build so that we would build them in a Drupal best practice kind of way. Um, but they're specific and unique to their implementation of DCAN. So DCAN is extensible. As a company, we actually prefer when people don't extend it because then we can deliver it to them as a software, as a service, and be highly efficient at it. But inherently, it's extensible because it's Drupal, and that is also one of its, one of its value propositions. It's not uh, a box that every single person uh, needs to be locked into the way, uh, for example, Socrata customers only get the version of Socrata that Socrata is able to support as a multi-tenant software as a service. 
in the case of DCAN, it's, it's an open extensible platform, um, as any Drupal site is. And there's this option to get a software as a service version of it from, from Gov Delivery, if you wish. Um, just a couple of examples, uh, widely used at the state level. Sig so can talk to you more about this, but state of California, Georgia, Rhode Island, Oklahoma, um, all use it in uh, the United States. Uh, cities like Louisville and San Diego, uh, Louisville in particular is doing a great job, I think, um, actually engaging people that may not think of themselves as, as data geeks um, in their open data efforts. Um, so they're really one of our favorite projects in term, or customers in terms of, of uh, actually engaging people around data. Um, and then it's also used around the world, um, you know, somewhat ironically, uh, data.gov.ru and data.gov.ua, the Ukrainian open data portal, are both built on DCAN. <laughs> so, um, and uh, we have heard, uh, we, they've ne we're not a customer, needless to say, but um, we've had, had people on our team run into people, apparently, on their team at conferences, and apparently they're in love with DCAN, and uh, we're not sure how to feel about that, but um, in the context of open source and Drupal, it's awesome. Um, perhaps equally ironically, the uh, Saudi Arabian open data portal is DCAN, um, uh, maybe less ironically, the uh, Kyoto Open Data Portal just launched in this DCAN. So you can see the, the wide variability of DCAN sites in the world. Um, to us, that's just proof positive that it's not just open source in name. Like, yeah, we'll let you download the code if you want to, um, which is unfortunately how some government technology <laughs> vendors treat open source, but actually in fact, meaning that a lot of governments around the world are succeeding with it without being our customer, without talking to us. Um, and that's really fundamental to actual collaboratively built open source. Again, that's really not credit to us, that's credit to Drupal. Um, that's just the way Drupal works, and for more than a decade, that's the way the community has, has worked, so you can actually collaborate on code and actually deploy production uh, sites and actually sustain them um, in a variety of ways with your own talent, by hiring companies, by collaborating with your peers. Um, and that's really why it makes sense, I think, to use Drupal to do anything new, like, hey, I want to do a good job with government open data, is because of that community ethos and the, in fact, practical proven ability to, to, to pull that off. Um, dig, gonna dig in here a little bit to one, uh, sort of how far can you push DCAN example, because I love it, and as usual, Sid knows more about it than I do, so maybe he'll tell you more in a minute, but um, this is the state of Georgia's um, school performance agency, and yeah, they've got data in here, um, but the real point is they want to help parents figure out how good the schools in their community are. So if I go in here and I start typing a, a school, say my kid's high school, Cass High School, here's the data about it. Um, but I'm not really interested in data.json. I'm not really interested in looking at the rows and columns of that data, frankly. I'm interested in finding out how good the school is because that's where my kid goes to school. Or maybe there's a school choice option and I want to figure out how good the school is relative to another one that I might send my kid to. So DCAN today ships with a whole lot of data visualization and data dashboarding tools, which take those rows and columns of data that you put into uh, a spreadsheet that you upload and put into a data store um, that allows you design, to design things like this, um, you know, visual insight applications you might think of it as. Um, and this gives a whole lot of metadata about how good the school is relative to its peers um, and even lets you do some some comparisons and other things um, that are, are pretty cool and actually deliver people insights that they care about when you're a parent in the state of Georgia. So increasingly, we're you know there's a bunch of good ways to put up an open data portal. You can do it with CCAN, you can do it with DCAN, you can do it with Socrata, you can do it with um, Junar, you can do it with Open Data Soft. There's you know, a good handful of, of open data platforms out there that do a good job with that. Um, but what really is gonna matter, we think, in terms of um, the future of open data is actually delivering value that people perceive um, and uh, understand. And that means taking it way beyond our data geek community and into forums where, where um, people on the streets of their communities actually care about it. Um, that'll also make it politically sustainable, I think, if it is um, be actually that value is being experienced uh, to continue doing open data no matter what the elected officials uh, think in terms of its, its importance or popularity. Um, so we can go into some actual sort of back-end demo stuff, but let me just um, pause there and maybe take some questions if there are any, and then uh, invite Sid to um, come uh, talk a little bit about his experience in this idea of how to do open data right in terms of actually making a difference in people's lives. So any questions? Yeah.
So you said you'd like to uh, deliver this as a complete package. Is there still the concept of um, extensions and uh, users uh, from the community contributing um, uh, other pieces of code to uh, DCAN? Yeah, it's a great, great question. Um, so yes, there is. And no, we don't have it perfectly figured out how to, how to best support that. Um, so it is uh, at two levels. Um, not only possible, but but also happening. So there's a GitHub repo, which is the um, you know place where DCAN development is done, uh, really in the open, and you can uh, contribute um, issues there. Um, and we do accept um, pull requests from the community there. Um, there's also, of course, the level of uh, Drupal. So if you go to you know Drupal.org and you know, we use um, more than 100 contributed modules, but if you go to Drupal.org and um, you know, you're uh, looking at a specific Drupal module that we use, there's the opportunity to contribute there in the way that um, you would expect uh, for any contributed module on Drupal.org. So there's, there's two different paths to it. Where it gets challenging, the reason that I hedge a little bit is that we are uh, really committed to making this super easy and reliable um, from a security standpoint, um, from an upgrade uh, and compatibility standpoint and from a standards compliance standpoint for the governments that use DCAN. So the, uh, the release branch of DCAN, um, and we've got 110 branches here, but the, 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 in, even the fully made version that makes it really easy for you to, to spin it up, um, is uh, we, we are very uh, picky, I guess, about what gets into it, right? Um, and this is true for any, any maintainer of any Drupal distribution. I mean, you'll find the same thing with Open Atrium. You'll find the same thing with, uh, with, with Drupal Commerce, right? Um, so uh, you, we love you uh, as a community helping us to solve problems, particularly in Drupal contributed modules that we depend on. But when it comes to extending DCAN with new features that maybe are not from an existing Drupal contributed module, but something that you've coded brand new, um, we'd love to talk to you about it. We have mailing lists, we have uh, gitter.im as a, uh, um, a messaging client that uh, a lot of GitHub developers use where our development team is directly available uh, to communicate with. Um, we have a Slack channel set up that uh, some of our customers and our team and also people that are not our customers uh, collaborate. So there's a lot of opportunity to engage, um, but we may often say no to getting your pet feature into um, DCAN because then the entire world has to get it when they download DCAN and also it uh, has to, we have to be able to support it for our clients in a real software as a service context where if something happens at 3 a.m. on a Sunday we're responsible for it. Um, so um, the answer is yes but it may be uh, harder, harder than other open source projects to actually get your pull request in um, uh, depending on specifically what it is. That said, all these sites that I showed you have customizations, um, including, uh, you know, not being English first, which is straightforward to do with Drupal, but not, um, you know, not without some some complexity. Um, and they are succeeding with DCAN and they're upgrading to new versions of DCAN, but they have to do a little bit of work to add their own customizations in with each upgrade. Um, so they don't get quite the same elegance as you get as a software as a service, it just works, but you get the flexibility to actually solve your own problem. Um, like, hey, I want Japanese to be the, the language. Um, does that answer your question sufficiently? Do you have a deeper question about it? Uh, yeah, that ask, answered my question. Uh, I guess as a, uh, another question, do you have a uh, um, CSW in, interface uh, out of the box with uh, DCAN? Um, expose my lack of technical well, depth. Well, the, the OGC system. catalog services for the web uh, API, that's one of the ways that uh, data.gov harvests from uh, the NOAA data catalog. That's a great question. So do you happen to know the answer to that? Um, yeah, OGC yeah. catalog services for the web uh, API. Yeah. Um, so our... Yeah, our harvesting and, and federation is all done with data.json to data.gov. Data um, and um, I'm not on the product team, so I may well be, be ignorant of, of some other details. And I know we work with USPOD on the validator and, and other um, other things, but I don't know specifically about that, that harvesting standard. Um, we do have um, certain users of DCAN like the USDA extending the metadata with their own customizations and figuring out how to make sure that that 
the parts of it that are USPOD compliant get harvested while they also maintain additional uh, metadata fields beyond that. But I'm not familiar with, with that particular standard and whether any of the any DKIM users actually support it. And I don't think, therefore, it's out of the box or I would know about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a couple of questions. Um, so, some of them relate to how, how Drupal-ish you really are. Mm -hmm. um, is, is every distribution or data set a node? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, any so they have landing pages. Yes. In a sense. Yeah. Uh, Schema.org data set extension embedded RDFA. So these can be found independent of going to a particular site. Yeah. Um, that is another good question. Um, and again, I think I have to refer to the product team. I know they've looked at Schema.org um, uh, in the past, and I don't know if that is uh, if we support that out of the box today or not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Well, we have a we have a, um, a module, schema mapper module. So um, I think it'll be possible for us to you know catch up with every schema possible out there and, and, and endpoint. So we built a schema mapper module that allows people to basically do this mode mapping. It's not. It wouldn't be tailored to a one particular protocol, but it allow you to do mapping to do a variety of others. So far, that seems to be meeting people's needs. We also integrate with. Okay, so I would just encourage you maybe to support schema.org, which is a, you know, a, a web. Sure. Um, yeah, it does. Um, except all the major search engine providers support schema.org and, and OpenSearch, for example. Um, and while it's great to be flexible, uh, opening up the opportunity for proliferation of uh, multiple schema approaches is something that I'm sort of certainly against, um, especially in the science community. We've, we've had decades of that, and we're sort of trying to get away from that. Uh, next question is uh, related to, I think I heard you say, you've got a data content type. Is there just one? A data set content type. Just um, one? Yeah, so the paradigm is, we mimic the paradigm of CCAN, where there's a data set, uh, which is essentially the metadata container for n number of data resources, which are actually the, the CSVs, the rows and the columns. And so, yes, the data set content type is modeled after the um, DCAT uh, metadata standard and, and done implemented in the same way that CCAN does it. So I would encourage you to look at the Research Data Alliance data type okay. registry effort, and maybe you want to have some specializations mm -hmm. of that parent data content, data set content type mm -hmm. that actually supports scientific data types. Mm -hmm. Um, rather than just a, a generic data type. It's one of the limitations I, f I find of Drupal is that, you know, you, you have a content type for a thing and you don't have any relation uh, between content types. Yep. Um, okay, uh, and then I uh, didn't hear you talk about persistent identification at all. I'm sorry, what did I do? Persistent identification. Yep. Are you issuing DOIs? What are you doing for identification other than the node reference, the URL reference mm -hmm. for a data set, which is, you know, is, is one of those sort of things that, that we do, but yep. there's a tendency towards, so I see a DOI there. Who's the issuing authority for that? Uh, that is a good question. I see... Uh Access deal, is that meaningful? Yeah, you? you went to the paper <laughs> instead of the data set. Yeah. Um, There's another one down there. Uh, data set DOI, go down. Yep, that one. Yeah. No, uh, not that one, that one. Yep. Yeah. 
Um, oh, it's not clickable. Not oh. linked. Yeah. Um, so this is uh, implemented by USDA, and this is what they've uh, how they've chosen to do it for their uh, ag science data. Okay. Um, and they've made their own choices around that, and we support them in figuring out the best way to implement those choices in a way that's consistent with with uh, the underlying downloadable DCAN distribution. Sure. So this is where sort of a community, you know, can weigh in on mm -hmm. what the practices should be for yep. the for those types of things because yep. it's the last kilometer problem. It's Absolutely. actually getting yep. to the data <laughs> yep. that is sort of really critical about this. Yeah. Um, You're absolutely right, and I think it's a it's a common problem in the Drupal <laughs> universe, in particular, to have a version of Drupal that out of the box is intended to do a thing um, that's very specific, like open data portal, not just generic website, but also not make that so prescriptive that if your use case is entirely different, like you want to help parents figure out where the good schools are, um, that you have made it more difficult to use the eighty percent under. Um, by virtue of solving the last mile for your specific use case. And so there's absolutely a valid, in my view, it's a very valid tension and we are never getting it perfectly right. Um, we are spending a lot of time thinking about the different verticals as we think of them. And, and certainly the scientific research community is one of the important ones. Um, and within that there are thematic fo uh, focuses, you know, health, education, public safety, et cetera. Um, and I think that, we're just really starting to, to dig in deeply to how can we best manage those trade-offs and perhaps provide multiple permutations of DCAN out of the box over time that will already be pre-configured to be sort of best practice and standard compliant for a particular more focused community. Um, I'd say, you know, there's also, if you look at the Drupal 8 universe, there's also the, the early distributions uh, in the Drupal 8 world are, um, getting less prescriptive in a sense, maybe partly because they're, they're, they're earlier, less mature, but also they're, they're really just trying to solve the 80%, like the Acquia's Lightning Distro, if you're familiar with it, um, doesn't prescribe the last mile at all because they want it to be a toolkit to build um, other sites. And I think um, we really want input and feedback from the community about what judgment calls we should be making in that regard. Should we just try to solve your 80%? Should we try to solve 100% for a number of focused uh, use cases? Um, and where, where's the right the right line in there? Yeah. So I, I want to yield to James uh, to ask a question, but uh, the I was going to ask what version of Drupal your, is sort of your fundamental base? Is it still 7 or 8? Still Drupal 7, yep. Yeah. Um, we're certainly looking hard at how best to... Um, to uh, release a Drupal 8 version. Um, in the case of our customers, part of our sort of convenient uh, thing business-wise, if we can wait and make that call when they really need the utility of Drupal 8 and they're missing it and they don't are not going to have to worry about the complexity or the cost of doing that upgrade. And because that's how we are funded as a team, that's, that is our primary um, focus is how to make sure that we do a good job by the customers that we're providing a software as a service to. Um, that said, I think if we are looking at, and in many cases, collaborating with uh, governments and sometimes other companies that are building Drupal 8 government-focused distributions of Drupal, um, for example, the, the public plan organization in, in Germany just launched DEGOV, which is a Drupal 8 um, uh, lightning-based uh, implementation of Drupal for uh, German governments. Um, and we're talking very actively with those people about the right building blocks to build Drupal 8 DCAN with, and in fact also where there should be just a, a complete blurring of the line between content and data, between data portal and you know engagement website and those sorts of things, because it, you've got a lot of flexibility in Drupal 8 um, in terms of how you, how you do that. Um, so uh, I'd say we're actively working on it, but for at least this uh, 2017, you're still gonna be using Drupal, Drupal 7 Decan if you're downloading it from from our uh, public repositories. Okay, so don't don't answer this question now. Okay, but maybe later. So I didn't hear you mention RDF at all. Mm -hmm. I'd like to hear about that later. Sure. All right. So, um, hi, uh, Jim Gallagher. I'm from OpenDAP. Um, so actually, so this, I hate it when people do what I'm about to do, but I, I'm. I'm going to ask you a question later, but first I'm going to say two things about what Peter Fox said. And he mentioned schema.org and, and your response as a developer. I'm a developer too. I'm the tech lead on a four-person team for an open source project. And so I totally get 
your like thing that people tell you to do all these different things, but schema.org is, is not one of those different things. It's actually sort of like risen to the top of the pile. Yep. It's definitely worth looking at. It's one of the things that Google's engines are crawling and recognizing. Yep. And, um, and so the thing that I really think about a lot in OpenDAP is how people can find the data that they put online using our data server. The kinds of data that OpenDAP server works with is very different than the kinds of data that you're talking about here. Uh, typically, OpenDAP works with really large satellite data sets. Um, but finding them is a huge issue. And it turns out that most people find most of the data they use by Google. Mm. Right. So having your data sets be crawled and found is, is really key. And that's one of the things that schema.org gives you. It makes yep. you crawlable. So the other thing I was going to say is that uh, this business about persistence and moving, you would think that when you work with an organization like NASA or NOAA, that their data would be like stationary and it wouldn't move. But you would be wrong. You would be <laughs> very wrong. <laughs> Yep. And this is a major source of frustration for users. Again, opened up small company. I see all the support emails. I know what happens and data move all the time. So those yes. DOIs, they're a really big deal. Yep. Okay. So my question actually doesn't have to do with any of your software, which appears to be truly wonderful. Um, and we use Drupal for a bunch of things and we're yep. really interested in DCAN as well. And we've been following it for a while, but has to do with your business model. Yeah. And you talked a lot about, you know, your software as a service and you do all this work. And then you said, yeah, but you know, we really don't want anybody to use us. Um, but you've got a four person development team and you've uh, got at least five people. <laughs> because bigger, it's, more... it's bigger. Um, yeah. So I'm sorry to finish the question. Yeah, yeah, so can you talk a little bit about your business model? Your yeah, business I just, operation? I mean, this is not a sales presentation, um, <clears> but um, given the opportunity, absolutely, I will talk about it. Um, and, uh, you know, and I, I'm also just really uh, a bit of an open source zealot and come at this because I want to create public value. So that's that's probably why I'm a little bit, a little bit, um, uh, you know, less less out there with the sales side than I should. But it is really important, oh, even if you don't... Can I interrupt you for just a second? Yeah, please. So the reason I'm asking this question is not merely just because I'm selfish, but yeah. also because um, there's a lot of talk that goes on at ESIP about the sustainability of projects once Absolutely. they get started. And yeah. so I'm asking this question in the context of project sustainability. So. Absolutely. So um, we care deeply about our business model, um, a, because it's fun to build a great business. Um, we've been fortunate enough after I created the company. Um, I'm looking, I think I took out all the slides that will even tell you about our business model here. Um, my bad. But um, we're fortunate enough to build a successful enough startup. To, we actually got purchased by a larger company that has thousands of government clients, Gov Delivery. Um, that company has now been purchased by another company. And is, we're now going to be twice as big. We're merging with another company called Granicus. Um, and um, it's owned by the Vista Technology Partners, the largest private equity software investor in the world. So there's major institutional investment behind uh, this entity that we are part of. And so we went from an idea to that, even though we're a very small drop in that very large bucket. Um, I think it's really cool business-wise that we've got a true open source project that is being used in 32 countries that has followed that trajectory and that is now uh, corporate wise that that big um, there's absolutely downsides to that right as a open source zealot that cares about that perhaps more than than anything else um, you know there, I constantly have to keep reminding people why it's a good business model um, to be candid uh, but I think that's okay that's again a healthy tension and that's reflective of what the state of the industry is in terms of government technology I mean you think that open source would be uh, sort of a given and um, yet we only just in the last six months got a White House, White House open source policy at all. Um, and we have a lot of red herring still out there about open source in terms of its security and sustainability and all that. So regardless of software license, yeah, having money going into a piece of software um, is fundamental to its sustainability and its success. And so we care a lot about having clients and we hope audaciously to have, uh, you know, Mag orders of magnitude greater clients going forward. Um, we have uh, enough, and I mentioned a bunch of the states and a bunch of the federal agencies, uh, the Veterans Administration will be, will be launching soon, um, that uh, we've got a good, healthy, uh, small part of quite a large business. 
And we are absolutely uh, prefer when people don't take DCAN and try to solve their own problem, but instead work with us to figure out how we can help them solve their problem within the box of the software as a service that we offer them. Um, that's not just because we then make money off of it. It's also because that adds more investment to the core of the projects, right? So there's a there's a, a double bottom line there for you as a prospective DCAN user to actually give us money to help you because then you're also helping DCAN become better. Um, and then also we think that in many cases governments will be better served by being within our software as a service box because not only are we sort of the world's experts on DCAN, but also um, we it gets better over time. And if you're a software as a service customer, you don't need to worry about um, forwards compatibility, basically. We take care of all that complexity for you. Whereas if you are Kyoto, um, you really have to know what you're, or, or Saudi Arabia, you really have to know what you're doing. Um, you really have to, I mean, Drupal upgrades are not um, probably as seamless as Sid is fond of reminding me as WordPress upgrades. And, um, you know, it can be complex, especially if you've done custom custom things. So I guess two, two, two summary answers. One, absolutely, we have lots of creative ways to solve your problem, even if you don't think we support the feature that you need. Um, and even if we will tell you no to your customization, it may well be on a roadmap for soon, or there may be other ways to solve the same need that you have that we've already experienced on behalf of other customers. So absolutely talk to us about, about working with us um, for the software as a service. But if you don't end up becoming our customer on the merits or just because that is better for you, um, do talk to our team about how best to solve your, your problem as part of the peer community of, of users. And do that on the GitHub issue queues, do that on our mailing list, do that in our Gitter um, instant messaging room, because we'll learn from why didn't you work with us as a software as a service, and that's really important you know, market data for us. What problem were you trying to solve that we couldn't solve for you, or, or is it just that we were too expensive, or what have you? And also, you will learn um, how to make sure you stay aligned with the product, and rather than going off and basically building your own snowflake, which will mean that you'll lose the benefit of all of the future product uh, point releases that we issue every two months or so. Um, so there's a whole bunch of reasons to be in touch. Um, and absolutely, if you want to be in touch in a commercial way, uh, we would be even more excited to, to talk to you. But um, you know, we really mean it when we say we love it when co governments adopt uh, DCAN and don't pay us because we think it's a fundamental part of the business model. Obviously, without a successful transactional money generating part of the business model, none of that matters. Um, but it, both parts are really, truly important to us. Um, and it's very simple. You just pay one annual fee. That's basically it. We try to make it super simple. So, any other questions? All right. Um, with that, let me um, invite Sid up to talk a bit about um, his work because he's really the one hands on with a lot of our government clients. Um, and uh, if you want to go into any features, there's a bunch that we could dive into here more, Sid, workflow and audits and whatnot. Um, yeah. What do you think would add value? Come up to the mic just because so it'll be, it's being recorded and all that. Is there else the mic yeah. just, just use that one. And I can drive for you if you want. Yeah, to. that'd be awesome. And I might actually, is this the live deck? Uh, it is. Okay, yeah. cool. I might move a slide over then. Okay. Um, yeah, just a couple quick things. To kind of recap, I don't want to, I definitely, on the scheme of our work, I definitely want to get the wrong impression. It's not that we actually don't want to pay attention to what's rising to the top naturally. Um, I can, But I think we all have our lightning rod issues, and even Andrew and I disagree somewhat. We have a very, very healthy tension around sort of where the balance is, but how much time we spend developing new products and features, and how much time do we want to encourage agencies to sort of take and download an open source project and customize it. Um, and I'm... I've spent the last well 10 years working in open data, almost 10 years, and have seen now many of the portals that I worked on, going back as far as 09, have been sunset over the years because, and then been brought back using different software um, providers. And it's just kind of been this churn within the open data space um, uh, around what to look for or what to find when it comes to uh, like some of the perfect open data technology. And what I've, I guess, come to realize is that there is no open data technology that everybody will agree on, you know, meets everyone's needs. And what ends up happening is, is as turnover happens in IT shops, CTOs, CIOs come in, they sort of have their, their bend, their lens of what they think open data should be about, right? Whether it be more technical back-end data management or more front-end data engagement. Um, so that, and to kind of continue that thread, um, 
I've concluded, and I wouldn't say it's a perfect conclusion, but it's present day conclusion. Uh, I definitely am open to change my mind in the future. But um, I have seen more success in agencies that invest on what they can, what value they can drive with their data than how clean and pretty and perfectly they can manage their data and all the technology sort of, you know, considerations that go into that. And that's hard to say, even as a technologist, um, I would prefer just to get a bunch of requirements and just meet the requirements and then call it done. Um, because this, what I'm about to talk about kind of briefly um, is a lot harder to measure and a lot harder to do. And we're not actually very good at communicating oftentimes, especially with our constituents. So it's forcing a different way of thinking about um, data and open data. And I actually appreciated the fact that, um, you know, these major search engines are starting to pay attention to these databases. Uh, it's going to make it a huge uh, benefit to actually releasing the data in the first place. One quick kind of uh, real world use case to kind of uh, to drive that point home and then I'll move on. Um, there are two federal agencies that we work kind of closely with right now. One has uh, spent some sum of money and has a highly customized version of an open data portal. They're largely, you know, it's problematic on where they're now going to go next. They're having problems with budgets. Now they're feeling like they have to maintain this huge software that they really, you know, have to have developers dedicated to now versus one agency who bought a SaaS version of DCAN and put, spent all the same amount of money the other agency uh, spent to drive value of that. So they have, and instead they have 7 million people who've subscribed across their topics that they have as an organization. And they're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on professional services to do large outreach campaigns. Tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people will visit uh, their uh, data stories and, and, and dashboards as they develop them. So they've sort of built in success before they even thought about the technology. They bought a technology and they figured, now I'm going to drive value to it. And it may be valuable later for them to develop, to, to invest in developer resources to customize or modify. But for today, I feel like their view is, is, is a healthier view if we're going to, if we're going to be honest. And I, it's a hard thing to talk about because a lot of folks, uh, um, I think I put a lot of effort and time into these projects and should be commended for that. But we're to the point now where many places are questioning the amount of money they're spending. And we, we've got to be able to point at some sort of ROI on it. So, all right, that was my oh, was just a tiny little soapbox for a second. But if you want to take a look at sort of how we're approaching open data, um, do you want me to drive that from here? I can do it. Yeah, um, we're just using probably the simplest... Uh, tool in the box. Uh, and the reason I did this is because for what reason I just said, I'm not actually working mostly now with technologists. Most of the folks that I work with, we did 50 people yesterday um, at the VA. They're almost none of them were technologists. They're just staffers. And they're, they're, they're the people that are collecting information, forms, business uh, process management. And um, we we're trying to figure out how could we equip them to be able to leverage their data uh, the data that they have, thousands of data sets, over 2,000 right now, VA does. How can we uh, train them and sort of give them simple tools to be able to leverage it? And we just started with using the basic user story format, kind of borrowing from Scrum and Agile methodology. Um, to And if you guys, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with user stories. Um, we just start with, start with a simple uh, user story. And then if you can go to the next slide here real quickly. And it aligns really well with what government's already used to. Uh, goals, programs, objectives aligns really well with epics, stories, tasks, that kind of thing. And so what we start with is obviously what our epic is or what we're trying to accomplish at a large scale. Um, these are all really simple KPIs that they're used to seeing. Um, next slide. And, um, and then we start writing user stories. And actually, if you could, would you pull up... Uh, demo.getdcan real quick? Because this I, I just, we don't have much time and I want to sort of... They want to drive this point home. It'll be easier if they just see it in slides. So just pull up, click on stories there. So you saw our user story. You all know what user stories are. Um, click on any one of those. And this is going to be really pedestrian probably for most of you all because you guys are used to seeing this, um, seeing uh, user stories and sort of breaking them down, breaking down large complex problems. But for most people who are touching data for the first time, this is not, their, not what they're used to. Now, if you, you're not logged into that, are you? I am. Oh, maybe you have to close oh. the download thing right here. So you, oh, you aren't logged into it. Can you log into it real quick? I just want to show it. So by writing a series, think about one data story, for example, or one place that we want to send a lot of people. We're working right now with the VA on, on suicide prevention of veterans. There's some very compelling 
uh, metrics that they can show not only veterans, but actually people, families of veterans in order to uh, sort of get them to take action. Ultimately, that's what we're trying to do. If you think about it, our little mantra is reach, engage, convert. We don't want to just publish data, get to a lot of people. We actually want to make sure that we're giving the right content at the right time. But then lastly, we're getting them to take action. So you'll find as you as we mature uh, and working with more agencies, most of the times, most of the data portals, like the one that Andrew showed you that answers the question, where are the best schools, are actually geared towards answering a, a, key, pro, uh, a key question or solving a key problem. And um, they're having, by the way, uh, loads more success than any of the other standard open data portals in terms of traffic and conversions, people clicking on things. Did you get it? Awesome. So just go to one of the story pages. Yeah. I just wanted to click. Oh. Somehow I'm logged out. I apologize. And you weren't logged in? No. Okay, no worries. Yeah. Um, so if you've ever built a, a web page, as you all have, you can imagine you have containers or layouts on a page. And I just, I just again, it's kind of pedestrian, but I just wanted to explain to you the way that we do it is we just write down those user stories, develop an epic, write down the user stories, and just plug those into the layout. And it's sort of just like if you think about it, a map to success for how to make sure that you're not just gathering data, that you're not just uh, structuring it, uh, typing up you know, tidy data, good metadata uh, management, and doing all those things, and then not having somebody get value out of it. So right there on the, is it not admin? Can you try that one? Yeah, but not um, under the password. Oh, OK. Um, and, uh, and then follow that process. So from the top reading down to the pop, top to the bottom, they're uh, sort of getting their questions answered. We're satisfying the user stories. And, uh, and we've had a really really positive feedback from citizens uh, who have experienced open data kind of uh, laid out that way. I think that was just kind of a five minute introduction to our integrating Agile, Agile to it. But if you want to show some more slides, that's fine. I think we're out of time. Yeah, so you have, uh, you know, what we want to measure, get the epics over on the side, what our stories are, and then over here, if you think about it, that's like our cheat sheet. That's actually open data. We want to show, did we increase uh, child care um, you know, quality, or did we increase the number of child care facilities that were available to people within the community? Um, I'll give you a, an example. I, I, I used to be a firefighter. One of the things we always did in the fire department was go out and test um, fire hydrants. Uh, and it's one of those data sets that virtually every city has, because like some departments, we've been used to collecting certain types of data because they were uh, for society reasons, there are various reasons they were required early on to know how effective we are being or how adequate the infrastructure was. And so, but it's a data set that often gets almost no views from, you know, relatively speaking, because nobody thinks about, wakes up in the morning and says, I really wonder how much water pressure is in the fire hydrant. But if we follow this paradigm here, which is, okay, as a homeowner, I don't actually need to know how well the fire hydrant works, but I need to know that if my house is going to burn, if it catches on fire. So it's this kind of, it's the same exact same data set, but it's just a different way of looking at it. We just take the citizen story and apply that to the data set. So now I can say, all right, uh, in this case, we don't have the, the, the hydrants on there, but you can see here, if we have the distance to the nearest fire, hyd or fire hydrant or fire station, why does that actually matter? Your insurance cares about that. Um, actually, one of the first hackathons we uh, did, uh, we actually built a small app that would take the G uh, GIS locations of every fire station um, in the state, and you could type in your address, and it was, the app was called "Will it will my house burn?" And it was the you know, question was like, "How close were you to the nearest fire fire station based on the average response time across the state?" So you can just see by just putting the citizen story lens on it, it makes the data a lot more valuable. And then, of course, building charts and graphs to report what the difference, the changes that you're experiencing or seeing is really quite simple to do. This is not actually complicated. It was just putting the citizen. Um, outcome lens on every data set that we look at uh, really changed the paradigm for us. So, so um, yeah. just back to the business model question for a moment. Um, you know, yeah, we provide a software as a service, turnkey. We worry about all the technical aspects of it. We provide service level agreements. We deal with security, all those things. Um, but a lot of what we spend time doing as a as a company is trying to help people solve these real world problems, right? So we have people that are experts in communications and um, engagement as well, and that's where we really think we offer a lot of a lot of value. So that goes way beyond DCAN, goes way beyond Drupal, but we think it's important to do that version of the last mile, not just the technological or feature last mile, but the outcome last mile. Um, and really excited about that as a company. Um, so just, I'd love you. Uh, really appreciate your time. Um, We'd love to have follow-ups from you. Um, there are a bunch of questions, that, especially more technical ones around standards that I don't feel like we answered completely. And 
um, if it's okay about you, I'd love to show up in one of your monthly um, uh, sessions that you do online and um, just bring some some more uh, detailed answers to those questions. We didn't get to the RDF question in particular and also get um, maybe some of our product team engineers who are smarter than both of us uh, to the table for that. Um, and please be in touch. Um, GitHub repo if you're technical for sure. Uh, emails obviously for, for Sid and I. And um, just can't thank you enough for the, the time and the chance to come talk to you today. So Great. thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you guys very much. Um, we will send out an email with the slides and the shared notes so that everyone can have access to that information, the questions and answers. And uh, we'll certainly have Andrew and, and the team invited back to the telecon. So look to the ESIP announcements for information on that. So thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>